good morning, or uh, for many people, maybe it's good evening, good day, uh, wherever you are, and welcome to our second briefing session um, for the, the festival with Dave Jarman, um, who is uh, a university lecturer at, um, at Bristol, and will tell you more about himself. Uh, and uh, I'd just like to say thanks very much, Dave, and, uh, and go for it. Marvellous. Thanks, Henry. Hello, everybody. Uh, pleasure to see you uh, again in many cases. Obviously, this is the second of our uh, briefing sessions. So in the first session, we were talking about the sources of good ideas. And in this session, we're starting to think about actually, how do they potentially create value for other people? So one of the things we're going to be talking about kind of quite a lot in this morning session uh, or this evening session wherever you happen to be in the world um is why do we need empathy why is empathy for others important when we're generating ideas and again we're going to talk a little bit about this idea of making the right thing rather than making the thing right i'm going to share a whole bunch of tools and these will be available to you um later this week after the session we're going to talk a bit about what we mean by assumptions why we have them and what we can do with them. And then again, we'll be talking about what you might do with some of the content, content and ideas from this session as you move forward thinking about the challenge. So there is a reason why we need empathy. And one of the biggest reasons we need empathy is because actually the single biggest reason that new ideas and new startups fail is, it, is because it transpires that nobody wants them. So, if you can see the slide well enough, the single biggest reason that startups fail is that there is no market need. So basically, time and energy and love and goodwill has been lavished on an idea. And then it goes to market and people turn around and say, oh, I don't need that. I don't want that. Um, I've got something better already. Or the thing that I've got isn't better than that. But you know what? It's cheaper and I know how to use it and I know it works and all my friends use it. So why would I do something else? So there's a big barrier to the adoption of new ideas and that's really about whether people kind of want them and need them. So some of you may recognize this. Many of you of a certain age will not. This is the Sinclair C5 and it actually dates back to 1985 and it was seen as a pioneering new way of getting around here in the UK. So you've got basically, uh, there, are, there are pedals hidden uh, in there. There's a handlebar underneath the knees and you'd cycle it around. And it's also got a battery, an electric motor. And it was seen as a kind of a great new sustainable economic form of transport. And it completely died a death. Uh, despite the fact that it was built in high tech factories, they had the Lotus car engineers build the chassis. Um, they spent over 8 million in 1985 developing it. They also lost 8 million as well because nobody wanted it. That actually, the thing that's really missing from this whole picture is imagine seeing one of those on the road next to a car. You'd be at the same height as the exhaust pipe. That car might not be able to see you because you're so low down. Don't forget, this is also a product that was launched in Britain. It rains quite a lot in Britain and there's no rain cover. So if they really expect you know, housewives to go and do their shopping in this thing, they might have thought some of these things through. So it's an amazing technical product, but users didn't want it for some blindingly apparent reasons, quite frankly, but were never picked up in the process. The story of the Sinclair C5 is, is well worth investigating further. However, the key thing here is that whatever your idea is, whatever your hunch is, whatever your sense of what the problem is, you need to go and validate that assumption. You need to get out of the building and go and test it out with people. Like, do you agree that this is a problem? Or how do you think about this problem? Or why is it a problem to you? Um, and only then do you have something that's actually kind of So we said in the previous session that innovation is not a linear process, that actually 
you know, you move backwards as often as you move forward. So in this process of exploration and testing things out with people, sometimes you will kind of pitch ideas to people and they go, no, 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 that's not how I think about it at all. Or that's not what I would want. Or actually, that's not the problem. The problem is actually this. But finding that stuff out early is so useful, so valuable, because it actually allows you to move forward more, more effectively over the longer term. So the first of the tools that I want to introduce today is a thing called the empathy map. Now, this is something that you can just tap into Google search and it will, it will dig it out or any other search engine that you choose to use. Others are available, but it's a really simple mechanism and it just allows you to think about, well, actually, who is my user? And then we might think about, you know, what are they trying to get done? What do they see? What do they say? What do they hear in their world? What, do, what are they trying to do? And what are they thinking and feeling? What sort of gains are they looking for? And pains are they feeling? And this just allows us to step into their shoes. So the first time you pick one of these up, you might just be scribbling on your, your guesses as to what you think your users or stakeholders might be thinking or feeling. But then having written those down, you might go, you know, what, actually, I know that some of these are really just guesses. So that's an opportunity to go and do some research uh, and then an opportunity to go and check to validate. But the empathy map is just a nice tool for using at lots of stages in your journey to go, how well do I understand my user and what they're trying to do? Because just because you think it's a problem or you think it's a good idea, it doesn't mean that they do. And it doesn't mean that they use your language. And that's really important because if you can anticipate their language, you're in a much better position to win them over with your arguments at a later stage because you're going to be talking their language. So another way of visualizing and capturing this kind of understanding of your user is to, to do something that we call a journey map. Now, this is a tool that lots of designers use. You'll find lots of examples of journey maps if you, if you, if you look for them. And um, what they all tend to do is break down the journey of a user as they experience a particular problem or they experience the use of a particular product or service. So from the moment they first think about it, to the moment they act on it, to the moment they go searching for it, to the moment they pick it up, to the moment they kind of put it down again. And what you're doing at each stage is you're trying to get a sense of what they might be thinking or doing and what they might be feeling. So what's their kind of emotional reaction to that piece? The one that you've got in front of you is you know, effectively uh, a visit to the doctor and a visit to the pharmacist. And that's just one kind of linear journey through. But you, anyone's experience of almost any problem or service can be captured as a journey map. And again, it's just a good one to start with as a way of sketching out what you think you're trying to do. So if you're trying to look at some sort of big economic change in the world, think about who the actors are in that and think about what they're trying to get done. You know, when and where do they encounter the problem? Who else do they talk to about it? What do they do about it? Where might you intervene or interact in that process to achieve something different? And again, these visualizations just help us map things out. So the third tool, I'm gonna to spend a little bit longer on this one, is what we call the value proposition canvas. And it consists, and again, this is easily searchable. All of the tools that I'm sharing today are open source tools. Um, what you've got here on the right hand side is a user and the user has a set of kind of characteristics and you're trying to work out what they want to get done and what the gains and pains they might feel or they might want to uh, be relieved of or achieve are. And then you've got the product offering or the service offering or the event or the activity or the organization that you're thinking of doing on the left hand side. And what you're looking for, a bit like a Venn diagram, is you're looking for those two things to fit and to overlay. That the, the better your product or service or offering is compared to their needs, the more likely they are to want it, need it, and use it. If you're offering lots of things that they don't want or need, or if they've got lots of problems that you're not actually doing anything about, that's not gonna fit. And it's not gonna work and it's not gonna feel compelling. The, the closer the fit between what you offer and what people want, the more likely they are to adopt it, to use it, and to get impact from it. So breaking that down a little bit, on the user side, we might think about the customer, what the, the stakeholders' jobs. What are they trying to get done? 
And that might be a task, I, you know, I want to travel from A to B. It might be that I want to have a certain social status. It might be that I want to be in a particular mood. I want to feel happier. Or I want to feel relieved. Or I want to feel calm. Or I want to feel energized. Every product and service, every organization that we interact with is because we're trying to get something done. We're trying to make ourselves feel a particular way. We're trying to achieve a particular status. And these have got relative degrees of importance. But there's also gains. Also, in the process of getting that job done, there might be ways that that could be made better. That we could feel really good about it. Um, so this idea of required, expected, desired, unexpected. A good analogy that I like is you're waiting for a bus to turn up and you've been told the bus should turn up every 20 minutes. So, you know, it turning up every 20 minutes is expected. You'd require it to turn up at least every 25 or you'd be upset. Desirable might be it turns up every 10 minutes. Unexpected might be it turns up every five minutes and that'd be amazing. But after 25, after it gets out of what you really required, we're starting to talk about pains. And we're starting to talk about things that you want to avoid. So just because a product or a service or organization helps you get something done, if the process of getting it done is so painful, so awkward, so socially stigmatizing, that actually it becomes not worth doing and you won't get the job done because this isn't the best way to do it. So there's a piece here that is about what is the job to be done? What's the outcome that people are looking to achieve? And then gains and pains are about the process of getting it done. And can you make the process of getting it done better and more rewarding? Or can you use it to relieve the pains and obstacles and awkwardness and inconsistencies that might also be present in that experience? So that idea of jobs to be done is really important. And what's really, really important here is that those jobs to be done are solution agnostic, that people need to get stuff done. And for the most part, they don't care how they do it. They just want it done. Now, as inventors, we have a habit of going, oh, but they want to do it like this, don't they? Not necessarily. You know, if you're a car salesman, you might assume that everybody wants to get from A to B by selling a car. They could do that by bike. They could walk. They could use virtual conferencing tools to, to cover the distance between them and another person. They could put something in a post to get something from one place to another. Actually, it's really good to think about what is the job that people are trying to do and be agnostic about how you solve that at the start. On the other side, the bit that you might build are the things that you might do. So these might be tangible or intangible, and they might have degrees of relevance you might create gains. These might be like better performance or more personalized or better savings or less wasteful, um, or they might be more usable. You know, every product or service you buy competes on a lot of these factors. And then there's pain relief as well. And how good are you at relieving people's pains? Does it just mitigate it or does it actually fix it and solve it? So again, go back to this idea that you're overlaying these two parts. You've got what they want and you've got what you're going to make. And actually, again, this is a tool for guessing at the start, for scribbling things in that you think might be true and working out how they might come together. One way of framing this is to think about how your products, your services, your ideas are improving lives. Are they allowing things to grow? You know, do people get kind of more time and money, more happiness, more fulfillment? You know, are you making their days easier? Are you reducing things that they want reduced? And again, you know, the post pandemic period has thrown a lot of these ideas into quite sharp contrast. So again, thinking about how things have changed, how practices have changed from our last session, and thinking about are there things that you can help your users grow, make easier or shrink? So one way of pulling all of that together is what we call an ad lib. So you can see on here that elements of the value proposition canvas are kind of written in against the blanks, but our thing helps these people who want to do this thing by reducing something and increasing something else, unlike the existing things, the competitors and the alternatives. But a little, frame, a little framing statement like that makes your idea or the problem really easy to articulate and for other people to comment on and to feed back on. 
And it also, it's, it's nice and simple. You can change it. You can swap ideas in and out of those blanks to see which are the most effective. So it's, it's really, really, really flexible. So a lot of the tools, a lot of the ideas that I've talked about are, are going to be made available to you. We've got some kind of the PDFs of some of those canvases, but a lot of them you can find in some of these places. So there's a Harvard Business Review article on design thinking. All of these ideas are kind of drawn from the discipline of design thinking, and that's well worth a read if you want to find out a bit more. There are two really good sites that are just chock full of fr absolutely free methods for researching things, empathizing with people, understanding what people want. So Design Kit is developed by the US design firm uh, IDEO, highly recommended. Uh, there's another one uh, from an organization called Board of Innovation. They've got loads of tools. Um, all of them are downloadable. Loads of them come with instructions. Lots of them come with video, um, really useful to use. Two other tools that I just want to mention quite quickly, partly because we, you might find them useful in the future. Um, if you're trying to, to, put, to put, put ideas down and take notes, or you're trying to collaborate with others to share ideas, there's a couple of really good online kind of whiteboard tools um, that are really good for kind of pu putting post-it notes on and synthesizing, uh, Mural and Miller Note. And again, there's lots of free usage before you have to pay for anything. But have a look at those because they're really good kind of fun tools. I use them a lot for remote collaboration and doing research with colleagues and we stick kind of virtual post-it notes up and that's kind of really powerful. Um, so, kind of pulling some of this together, you're going to be making some big assumptions. Like when you start to think about empathizing with others, when you start to think about drawing out their journey maps, when you start to think about kind of building a value proposition, you're gonna be making some big guesses about what people want, what they need, how they want it, where they want it, when they want it, uh, how you should talk about it, how often they need it. You know, what are these hunches and guesses and approximations and statements? And are they based at the moment on weak or limited evidence? So you might want to dig out more evidence, and that could be secondary research, or you could be doing primary research. You could be going talking to people. Which are the biggest guesses? Which are the, the, the wobbliest pillars in your model? Like, if you say, hey, we're gonna do this, and that's built on some really unsecure foundations, I would be testing those as a priority and trying to validate or invalidate them as quickly as you can. So the week one challenge, was doing your research. So finding some problems and opportunities, building those spare parts, um, but then also thinking about how you might empathize with others to gain insights and to draw that content together. So before I launch into the Q&A, the big piece next, uh, the big, the big piece in next week's first session will be generating ideas that will have. Sorry, Alison, can you um, uh, switch your camera off because you're on stage? <laughs> um, the first thing we'll be doing next week is drawing together um, a lot of the insights and data that you've been able to gather this week, a lot of the attempts to kind of create empathy that you look kind of looked at, and then we're going to move on to generating ideas. So we're still very much in our explore phase, still very much generating research, and actually the next stage will be, you know, bringing those together and actually shaping some ideas. So, any questions or queries? If you want to use the Q&A over on the right-hand side uh, and stick things in there, we'll be more than happy to try and field them. Can you unshare your screen and then? Uh... Brilliant. That's great. Yes, don't, can you not use the, ch the, the chat? Definitely use the, the questions and then we can see it. Uh, ah, okay, we've got a, a first question. Mm. Solutions being Solution agnostic, policy innovation, or policy makers solution agnostic. Now, this is this is one of the, the challenges that I think a lot of the time policymakers are not necessarily solution agnostic. They have got an ideology that they're they're working to. But I think when we're generating ideas, we need to start with the problem, not the solution. 
because if because this can be quite polarizing coming in with a very clear well no i think it should be done like this can instantly put the backs up of the people that you're trying to influence but if you come in going right look we all agree that this is a problem and think about how we frame this problem and how we talk about this problem and if you can get agreement that actually you are talking about the same problem in the same way then when you go to talk about solutions actually maybe you've just opened that up a little bit more and there are some more options to talk about henry you're more of a policy yeah well I, I, it's very interesting because when people use the word ideology what do they mean i suppose is, a, is an interesting question because uh, there may be assumptions and beliefs about how the world make the world a better place so i suppose if your ideology is a free market then you start with the solution that your idea that all solutions really are about creating better markets um and i suppose if you're um what you could your supposition actually is by involving more people or getting the community going you might focus on that but in a way it's almost impossible i would say to have to to, to not have some presuppositions about how the world works you know because even if you, you cannot start from scratch and go out and discover how the world works everyone has presuppositions and i suppose it's just how what how narrow those are or how wide they are how you know how blinkered uh, and really you know this is always the answer or open to different ideas you are but ultimately um you know you're not going to research whether bringing people on board and engaging with them uh to go somewhere and trying to be diverse and get everyone in now you might call that an ideology um but um you know you're probably not going to change that you know there might be some circumstances i suppose when people aren't going to engage at all maybe but i mean i don't think you can start for totally a blank sheet what do you think no but, and to be honest i mean in a sense the importance of these tools is to or is to understand what's on people's sheets of paper even as they get started you know i've heard this discussed as you know basically none of us see reality we all see reality through a filter we all have a map of the world and on each of our maps of the world, we choose to highlight particular kind of contours or features. You know, some of us have kind of almost the geographic map of the world. Some of us have the kind of the political map of the world. And we look for different features. Understanding other people helps us understand what is on their map. Yeah. So actually those conversations help us go, oh, you want to talk about this like this. Oh, you, you, you talk about this with this kind of assumption in mind. Right, okay. And that either means that we we then know how to talk to them about it and we can work with their map of the world or we have to, we know we have to do some work unpicking their map of the world before we can have that conversation but again this is this really highlights to me why empathy is so important that you know if we come in going hey this and they're going whoa, 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 whoa. no 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 we talk about it like this i think you'll find we're gonna butt heads Whereas if we can at least go, right, I know that you want to talk about it like this. So I'm going to think about how I work around that, or I'm going to think about how I use my language so that you don't see this as necessarily kind of scary or intimidating, or that I can give you a way to work with it. That makes a, a huge, huge difference. Yeah. And I think language, Dave, I mean, as you said, is so important because some language really people don't relate to and, and dislike. And actually this, I think, relates to the next question, what are some best ways to test your assumptions? Actually, the first thing is, actually, most of us don't know what our assumptions are. <laughs> yeah. Because there are, they're just, you know, they're the, the sea that, or the, the air we breathe. Uh, and so it comes back to your point that actually talking to other people suddenly helps you realize what assumptions are. And, and I think, and there, the diversity of people you talk to is key. Because if you just talk to everyone who thinks like you, they'll all have exactly the same assumptions. But it's interesting, and actually. Wonder, and, then, uh, and then you wonder why they why they do things that you don't agree with. Like, you know, I work in a, a university. I'm surrounded largely by kind of sort of, I guess, left-wing progressive thinkers. And then I always wonder why the country seems to vote in conservative governments. <laughs> but that's because the, the, the group of people that I talk to isn't diverse enough. And actually, you know, one of the things that you should do, like if you read kind of the... The newspapers on the on the left occasionally you should go and read the newspapers on the right just to to find out the language they use the things that they talk about 
so that actually if you want to persuade them you you start in some of their language because actually then they're, they're not attuned to your language so just in that kind of testing assumptions just to build on that yeah it's talking to other people we are going to talk about talk more about testing and prototyping when we get through to week three and i'll share some more specific methods about kind of testing and prototyping then but the single most important thing that you can do is talk to other people even when your idea is totally half formed because actually at that point it's cheap and if if somebody says no i don't agree with that or here's a different version of it it's easy for you to put down it's it's inexpensive for you to put down because you're not invested in it if you've spent months and years working and working and working on something where it is it's so precious to you and then somebody says you know what i don't want that in blue i want it in pink you're going to be furious and annoyed and frustrated so actually the best ways to test is to get sharing as soon as you can and that might be just saying it out loud it might be chatting to a group of people it might be drawing a sketch it might be kind of sharing an article that's something and asking for feedback but think about low cost ways to get your assumptions out there so people can feed back on them readily yeah. and try and make it as um non-confrontational as you can so you're asking for their opinion or you're asking um for them to kind of contribute to something rather than saying hey i've got this idea good or bad because you could be setting people lots of people don't like telling you that you're wrong so in entrepreneurship we sometimes refer to this as the mum test and basically if you said to your mum is this a good idea of course your mum's probably going to say yes that's a brilliant idea because they want to like you and they don't want to offend you and they want to care for you actually you almost need to talk to a stranger somebody who might not worry about potentially offending you and saying you know what do you what do you think of this so share sketches drawings one or two sentences examples yeah just get it out there and see how people respond and i think dave it's really interesting how that is counter to the the standard expert culture and we always have this problem uh, that people go off and do deep research and analyze and come up with a set of answers and, and they don't want to talk to anyone but um, until they've um, actually got it all worked out and uh, got deep into it and come up with their conclusions and they've got their detailed recommendations it's like hey wait a moment <laughs> and there's that's nothing it. like that to put people off no and that's it if, if you come in with a big kind of fully finished fully polished people kind of are often a little they're either reticent to try and tear it down either they don't feel that they've had long enough to look at it to give you any sensible criticism or they are going to have to really tear it up and you're going to be upset by that process so one of the bits of advice i often give is you know go and share your ideas quite soon quite quickly but think about maybe finding an expert in a subject matter to go right what about this and seeing what that expert makes of it because they may well tear it down quite quickly but if that happens early if that happens on day one rather than day 101 you've saved a lot of time and effort so in startup culture we talk about this as fast failure and how do you embrace failure so that you make lots of little cheap failures rather than big catastrophic failures after 100 days of working on something and only then sharing now the next question was it web whiteboard now i presume that was the virtual the tools that I, yeah so i mentioned a couple of tools um mural and milanote as good uh online basically they're kind of like online whiteboards and you can put post-it notes up and you can write on them and you can drop documents and pictures and draw things on them they basically do anything a kind of regular whiteboard does but with more digital linkage through um, mural milanote i've got links to them actually in uh, the, the third session uh, that i'm going to be running next tuesday um and they're, they're just tools that i use quite a lot with um with my team to kind of kick ideas around but there are others i'm sure Ooh, we're missing the end of this sentence here my advice to someone who's in a creative occupation Whoever wrote 
that i'd really like to see the end of the question because uh, yeah, if you just add whoever it was for what put in does this person have to give up well, some I'm, I'm curious to know what you think you have to give up <laughs> visual hunch is probably just not. added in the, the the last one and we'll count it yeah. towards uh, that um maybe just cover the great resources um yeah so we we will be there's a lot of handout material uh, created by the company Strategizer, who made both the value proposition canvas and I think of the business model canvas that you might have heard of. Um, and we're gonna try and get those up on the site later this week. Um, the design kit site and the board of innovation site are really good. And there's loads of free downloadable stuff there, lots of kind of PDF and uh, handouts to kind of print off and write on, scribble on. To be honest, typing some of those terms like value proposition, empathy map, uh, user journey map into search engine you will find lots and lots of examples and lots and lots of downloadable things and to be honest you can hand draw most of these things um lots of those online sharing tools like mirror and milano actually come pre-populated with templates that include things like user journey maps and value proposition canvases because they're such industry standards now brilliant and uh, we've got the end of it it was something does this person have to give up something? What would be your advice to someone who is a creative occupation? No, I don't. Who's long time been developing a particular skill? Uh, don't, no, don't give up, up, up anything. I think you do need to think about, if you're thinking of yourself as a creative, as you know, almost as if you are the product or you are the service, I think the critical thing is finding out who finds what you know how to do valuable. There's a tool called the Personal Business Model Canvas that might be worth a little look. And one of the things that it does is it, help, it helps you think about how you articulate the value that you create. So as, as a creative, you make stuff and you know how to make stuff. So it might be that it's the fruits of your work, your output, your kind of creative makings that are the valuable thing. But equally, it might be the fact that you know how to make things and people might find your skill set useful. And then it's just worth it's it's identifying who finds that valuable? Now, there is a decision here. How far away from what you want to do do you have to pivot before you find people who are willing to pay you to do it? And that might be a sacrifice you're willing to make, or it might be one that you're not. And fundamentally, lots of creatives have careers in which they do something to make the money, and then they use the money to spend the time doing the thing that they love. And that is an entirely personal decision to make. What you can't do is make people want the things that you want to make. That, that doesn't work. Dave, this, this next question is a really interesting one, I think, because I suppose a lot of your models, uh, I mean, a lot of business, if you're coming from more a business perspective, you sort of take the world as a given, i.e. you go out and say, this is what people want and so forth. But actually, if you're a campaigner and trying to change it, you're actually trying to reframe, get people to rethink what they want, mm. what they want to do, how the world is and so on. And so you're not trying to respond to the status quo and no, serve it, if you like. You're trying to radically change the status yeah. quo. So how does that change the sort of models that you need to look at? Um, that, so it's, it's a very way, different thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it's about going back to the, what the problem is. So rather than thinking in terms of solutions and thinking in terms of traditional solutions, it's going back and looking at the problem and going, well, actually, is there a different way to solve this? And actually, if you can convince people that the problem is big enough, urgent enough, painful enough, actually, people will turn around and think differently. Yeah. But you have to get them. You, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process of making the pain big enough that they have to move and making the new activity easy enough for them to do that they can kind of get over the the inertia and they can get over the barrier but somewhere between those two points of making it painful enough and easy enough actually most people can be moved but the, the issue here is that you can't change their mind they have to change their own mind all you can do is assemble the evidence that helped change your mind and assemble it in such a way that actually it can influence them and and some people are, are just very very difficult to convert and it might be that you need government to pull a big lever or make people do stuff. But then equally, that then creates a, that can create a backlash. So just look at the furor about masks 
at the moment and whether people like to be told what to do by the nanny state or whether actually if enough people are setting a good example people want to do that so again um just because it's current reading i mentioned it the other day uh Yvon Chouinard, the founder of patagonia really good book and this is a company who are doing things really differently and there's some great stuff in here about the, the philosophies that they've adopted and i found myself reading it going oh no you're right actually you know we should be repairing and fixing our clothes not just buying new clothes so if you assemble the evidence in a compelling enough way actually i think people you can change habits yeah well i think dave what, what's interesting is because the if there's a lot of possible pain one very human response to this is denial isn't it to yeah. uh you know uh, because especially if it's scary and big and feels out of control i mean climate change is obviously the christ the, the classic one and a lot of people a lot of us myself everyone is deeply in denial about this and and it's very interesting to see the sorts of techniques that uh, xr are sort of developing of trying to open up conversations because quite often although people are in denial somewhere lurking underneath are some worries and concerns but they don't want to talk about it or they and and how you sort of open that up a lot of what xr have done is they've made it immediately painful to people because they've gotten they've gotten in their face with it they've they've, they've interrupted people's daily lives with this news and gone no 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 you can't ignore this anymore no you you need to talk to me about it or you need to face this down you need to have an opinion and that that will help some people go no 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 you're right you're, you're right you're right actually i need to read this stuff i need to re-educate myself like there's been a lot of kind of re-education a lot of white people have been thinking about oh, how do i re-educate myself about the kind of black lives matter movement and it, and it forces a moment of engagement now inevitably some people don't want to be forced into that moment and you know you see vitriolic opposition to black lives matter to extinction rebellion to a lot of these things but actually an awful lot of people are being won over and are educating themselves and are changing their minds and i think you know we are seeing a, a progressive trend kind of coming through even if actually we get these moments of backlash and resistance but it's interesting what the, there's a chicken and egg thing here isn't there because um people sort of match their opinions and views to what they do don't they so there's i mean some people say if you get people doing things then they'll take on the the value set that's associated with the actions rather than trying to change people's minds and then get them to do things mm -hmm. so if people so the sort of idea there is that if people do some recycling and that's not difficult they're a recycler and if you're a recycler well you're an environmentalist and then what else do you do as an environmentalist and they they begin to their idea and their value and where they are changes and actually the actions lead rather than the mindset the mindset follows the actions rather than the uh, the actions following the mindset so i think yeah. it's, it's, there may be a balance between those two things but i, I think yeah. there's a lot of evidence that people adopt values that suit what they feel able to be in a sense yeah and actually this is this there's a really good piece of work um there's a, there's a book called the common cause handbook and i can't remember for the life of me who created but the common cause handbook it was called and it talks a lot about this idea of kind of shared and communal values and they did some research that sort of showed that if you hold certain types of value you are also likely to hold adjacent types of value so if you kind of have an interest in environmentalism you're, you're also likely to have some interest in things like social justice and similar but there are also kind of then almost opposed values that if you hold one type of value you're unlikely to hold another if you if you are in that sort of space about thinking about kind of cause based um problems and solutions the common cause handbook might be i think it's entirely freely available online might be worth a look because you might find some values that you can talk about because there is a big issue here about that is about people's self-identification and it goes back to that idea of almost carrot and stick like how do you either make it easy for people to identify by saying, hey, you already do this, you could do this, and, and equally stick saying, you can't do that anymore, you have to do this. And for certain of us at certain points, both of those methods have a degree of validity, that there isn't a, one, there isn't a silver bullet to this stuff. It's difficult, it's very, very human, 
and it, go, it goes back to one of the things I sort of said in the previous session about for big issues, how do you start small? Like if you're going to eat an elephant, you know, you do it a mouthful at a time. It's sorry, that's a horrible analogy in a situation. <laughs> but anyway, you, you get my point. It's you know, if you want to do something about social justice, how might you do that in a particular niche for a particular group of people? And find something that works and makes a difference there and then scale coming up with very grand solutions to things is really problematic because you're trying to be too many things to too many people and you're going to get too much resistance especially if you don't have the resources to do anything at that scale so thinking about how you can chew on kind of smaller pieces that will build up you know to use a a, a slightly different example you know when amazon started you know they were just doing books but in the name that they chose amazon they were conjuring the idea of something big and if you look there's that arrow that joins the a and the z you know they were right from the start they were like you know we're going to be the a to z of everything that you can buy online that vision of what they wanted to be was there even when they were just doing books but they were, they were so almost having a structure that would allow them to scale to other things and whilst you might not want to be amazon you could borrow that idea of having a big vision but taking small steps yeah. Dave, i'm just gonna i thought i might bring cena onto the stage because she's uh, asked this question about innovation and see get a response from her on um what she thinks of what we've said and further questions that she might have Hopefully she'll join us in a moment. Cool. Maybe while she's coming, uh, um, uh, that you might talk about the, the the other the Lindsay's question about other resources, and I think we've said that resources will be available later, and we'll let you know where they are. Um, and yeah, if other people have got suggestions, you know, by all means, stick them in the Q and A. Obviously, let Henry and the team know, and we'll kind of circulate those as well. I was conscious I only had about sort of 20 minutes this morning, uh, rather than kind of bombard you with all the possibles. It was kind of really getting across the, the value of empathizing, the value of co-creation, the value of working with others to design and develop solutions. That, that for me, is the, the, the super important thing. Um, okay. But there's a lot of organizations that are doing this, um, and it's well worth you know, working with those and thinking about those. Cena doesn't seem to be able to join us. So let's move on to Deborah um, on policy innovation again, mm. when there isn't consensus. I think it's trying to build consensus. Um, I'm trying to think of a specific example. Yeah. Well, I, I, while you're thinking, I'll give mine because actually we're doing some work on this around management of a catchment and we're using a particular tool actually to to do it where basically you get all the different uh people uh, uh, different stakeholders in the catchment who have different perspectives on what the problem is in the catchment what needs to be done and so forth and just actually get them out on the table but in particular get them out on the table anonymously because uh, people Quite often don't say things because they're worried about the reaction or they might insult mm. and so forth and someone's opinion might be well all the bloody farmers they're <laughs> ruining the whole thing and 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 why do they think that and, and begin to once you get them out there and then you can actually get people to uh, what we're going to do is see do people to what extent do people agree or disagree with everyone else and you can then begin to map where the real differences of opinion are which may be due to issues of trust maybe issues of evidence, different perspectives on what the problem is and so on. But only when you've actually got to the real nitty gritty of where the, the differences are, can you begin to work through uh, uh, and find a way of bringing people together? And Because a lot of things might be just different beliefs, different assumptions, all sorts of stuff could underlie it. Unless you start digging in, um, you, you can't really work out what is actually going on. I think that's a really important point there, kind of, I think, pulling identity and hierarchy out of this sometimes really helps. Like, as a, as a slightly kind of different piece, I've done a lot of kind of senior leadership kind of 
kind of training events in the university sector for a number of years. And when when individuals from different universities have badges on that say their rank at their university and their university's name, suddenly people start deferring to other people. People start going, oh, you do a more senior job, but a, a less prestigious institution. And they, and they start listening to each other in different ways. <laughs> when they just have a badge on that says Dave or Henry, actually, and they don't know the rest of that detail, you get a, you get a much more open conversation. So actually, a lot of it is about how you frame the context in which the ideas come together, in which the participants come together. And if you can kind of pull away some of the, the, the traditions and the hierarchies and the kind of frameworks, actually, you can get a more open um, discussion. Some people are very, very status oriented, for better or for worse. <laughs> This is interesting. Well, because this is, uh, uh, you know, has the pandemic made any difference? Uh, I mean, actually, is there evidence? I wonder if there are, people have actually looked at this. I mean, there's obviously loads of articles about this and lots of propositions and so forth. But um, I'm not I aware of any it, really systematic assessment. I think it depends on the context you're in. So, for example, in the university that I work in, um, we liked teaching in physical classrooms and people would have sworn blind that that was the only way and the best way to do what we do and now that we're all doing it online actually a lot of us are going you know what this is better and that this is opportune so whilst that that might feel very niche i think a lot of processes have been interrupted i think people have been knocked out of their ruts and we do have a window in which they are doing something different and they and they are not allowed to do what they usually do to kind of seize the agenda before they just go back and climb back into the rut because the rut is very comfortable. So I think I think that's going to be very specific from industry area to, to industry area and policy area to policy area. But I, th I think we will find examples where people just can't do what they used to do. Brilliant. Um, Lindsay actually, uh, Maybe uh, we could just get Lindsay up to, to I'll be interested in her thoughts as to whether uh, there's difference. Um, Lindsay, can you just put your camera and uh, microphone on? Actually, just very quickly, the Real Ideas organization, which is what I think Lindsay's representing here, are an amazing organization who do incredible stuff and are well worth checking out. <laughs> so there's an introduction for you, Lindsay, but uh, I'd be interested if you want to just, if you put your camera, there you go. Why on? Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, thank Hi. you for the intro, Dave. That's very kind. So I was just thinking, Lindsay, you know, to, uh, you said the good models of collaborative co-production. Are the, I mean, in, the, in terms of the sorts of models that Dave was talking about, how different are they, uh, would you say, in terms of how they work? Um, I think the sort of, probably the big difference is, um, and I completely get it, Dave, we, we use all the sort of stuff you're talking about as well. But I suppose it's that idea that sometimes I think we um, uh, believe that we have to come with um, something a bit more formed. And a lot of the work that we've done, particularly with young people, is really to say, let's work with you every single step of the way. So how do we go on the journey of uh, perhaps we're meeting with a group of young people living in a particular community and what we're trying to do is to involve them in the process of not just identifying the problem but of actually then working through their experiences and through their experiences to sort of iterate uh, something which then as a product or a service can um, can be successful and and so it's um, it's very much the sort of fundamentals of what you're talking about but it's uh, I guess more of a um, a sort of con constant relationship rather than something which is a bit like I come up with something I test it I refine it I go back it's more of a let's actually do this really together and, and what then happens is that as well as evolving a product or a service you also then upskill a group of people who um, become incredibly passionate about it so you have this amazing bunch of advocates but also who then um, to some extent start to solve a whole other set of problems that they perhaps are living with and I suppose that's the bit which I find you know in the context of building back better and 
sort of something a bit more radical. That's what's really exciting. You know, you mm. can change the context as well as ending up with a, some form of entrepreneurial service, mm. I guess. And, and just to build on that, I think the idea that you not only provide the tools, but the confidence mm. to solve one problem actually gives them the tools and confidence to solve multiple problems. Yeah, so absolutely. Actually, yeah. yeah I, mean, I can work with a, an organization called Norwest West Media Center in yeah, Bristol. Fabulous. I'm sure you're well aware of them. Yeah. Um, and kind of using some of the RSAs, um, mm. kind of student and people design award materials mm. to, to teach students how to use a kind of a design sprint methodology, not unlike the one that we're kind of sharing with this sure. program. So that actually you, they've got a method so that at any point in the future when they bump into something, they go, you know, what? I know how to, I could try and tackle this. Mm. I know how to structure these conversations. So it's not something that happens to them. It's, ha it's something that happens with them and through them. Exactly. We, I mean, we have a sort of favourite example, which is a young man called Billy, who um, lives in Redruth in West Cornwall, and uh, he hadn't left his bedroom for seven years. Um, you know, all sorts of quite significant mental health issues. And um, he, uh, in, in working with him, he, he was a great gamer, great online gamer. That's how he lived his life. Um, and in working with him to start thinking about entrepreneurial ideas, what he was trying to do was use his gaming knowledge, which was extensive, but also deal with the fact that he did want to get out of his bedroom. He wanted to understand how to overcome all of that. Um, so what he ended up doing was actually developing um, a sort of face-to-face -face confidence building game, I guess is what you call it, which where he, this was pre-COVID, he invited you know groups of people to come and sit around the table and, and play a game. And the game that they invented was all about how do you build confidence? Um, and it, uh, it was quite bizarre. It actually went viral. Um, we had this sort of amazing moment um, where it got picked up by the local news. And uh, I suddenly got messages from friends you know, on the other side of the world saying, what's going on? Um, and it was really interesting. So he ended up with something which was his enterprise um, and, and a methodology. He also, in the process, moved himself a long way and lots of the people he worked with, and, um, which is brilliant. So yeah, there, there definitely is it's quite a radical solution if you can get it working. Mm. And that's partly that piece about, you know, being focused on a problem and being focused on a user and what they can do and what they can bring to it, rather than sort of saying, well, there's this big ephemeral thing in the distance. How do we do that? It's like, well, where are you and what have you got and what do you need to deal with? Mm. And start from there and it can build and grow. Absolutely. And also be prepared to constantly give it away. One of the best pieces of advice I had from somebody 20 years ago was, whenever you have ideas, don't hold on to them, don't get caught up in this protecting your IP thing, you know, actually constantly give things away. And actually, I have absolutely found over the years that by doing that, you gain more because you gain connections, partnerships, interest, and, um, uh, you know, so it really works. So I think I'd really recommend be a little bit careful about that mindset, which is, oh God, I've got to keep everything secret because somebody will steal my idea. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much, Lindsay. That's great. If you switch your camera and microphone off, you'll, well you'll leave us back onto the floor. So there's Hi. a couple of questions that if we can get to very quickly, the democratic deficit working with elected officials, I'm going to have to be very, to be honest, this is like every other person. They've got, a, they've got a map of the world. They've got an agenda. They've got sensitivities. They've got a particular language. You need to talk to them and, and, and find out what they're trying to get done because they will have optics they will have a perspective on this and the, the better we understand that the more likely we are to work with kind of community groups who want to, to challenge things some of them will be quite entrenched not all of them i'm a town councillor i was quite surprised when i joined a town council thinking that it might be quite set in its ways i was really surprised at the number of people who were not set in their ways but they needed help and support and language to articulate things differently um, uh, just just to add to that, as a civil servant, um, you know, there is a standard uh, thing that as a civil servant, you need to involve and hear and bring to the attention of ministers the diversity of views. And good policy is based on a hearing and involving a diversity of views. So that that is an angle. And any civil servant who also wants positive outcomes can use that to involve people. So if you find create relationships uh, with um uh, say civil servants with more empathy towards uh, uh, your your perspectives, they should be able to bring you into the system uh, within the, the, the status quo rules. 
Uh, so it should be possible. Just to pick up the legal one very quickly, it entirely depends. So doing something better than someone else in principle is perfectly fine. What you shouldn't do is copy anything that is protected. So obviously logos, trademarks, if there are you know, patents on scientific mechanical processes, if they've got any design rights over the look and feel of a thing, or they've got any copyright on the text. You, you can't just take what they've done and do it again using all of their words and all of their images and all of their, uh, their, their, their tools necessarily. But a lot of the methodology that they might have used is probably not protected. You know, lots of processes on, that are not scientific or mechanical are not protected. So you just need to do a little bit of research into whether anything that they've been doing is protected by any form of intellectual property. You know, if And the other issue, obviously, you just need to think about whether you're going to offend them or anyone else in simply kind of taking it and doing it better. Um, I would always encourage you know, a bit of research and a bit of collaboration rather than just saying, I can do this better, right. I'm gonna to have to disappear in a moment just to let you know. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'll do the, the, the chicken and egg. Uh, um, let's, <clears throat> we have, we're running out of time anyway. What is the best way to introduce change and innovation then? Where to begin? Well, actually you have to do both and is the general rule. Um, but be aware that some, for some people, it might be easier to get people starting to do things and then bring the value proposition along with them rather than try and convince them, especially if they're in a totally different uh, space altogether. Mm -hmm. the, you know, to, to change people's perspectives and show them the pain. I mean, people don't want it, but it could be hugely resistant. Whereas showing them something they can do, getting to meet other people with different values that link to that, will pull them through. And suddenly at the end of it, they're an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, watch Mrs. America, because it's very interesting, because one of the things that the feminist side say, there was a great statement of to the resistors to the Equal Rights Amendment in the US, was she asked them, so, what have you learned? And they said, oh yeah, we've learned to do budgets, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, well, you've now become a working girl, haven't you? Uh, and, and so, you know, so they are actually become what they're trying to resist becoming. And then, and it's showed how one person then values changed because of actually her experiences mm -hmm. in a radical way. But uh, now, I think the trick is to get started. And if you can get started quickly and cheaply and easily, and you can fail and then try something else without any kind of real loss of kind of time and energy and reputation, great. Why, why do you think people are so bad at brainstorming? Why do they, you know, are people sort of restrained or they feel, I suppose they don't want to seem stupid, is that it? Or, or yeah. The fear of being judged is almost certainly the single biggest issue of brainstorming. Is that there are some of us, and I'm in this camp, uh, don't have much of a filter between their brain and their mouth. So they're quite happy in brainstorms because they're happy just making stuff up and winging it and saying it out loud. There are other people, believe it or not, who are actually much more careful about what they say and are much more considered in what they say. And there is a filter. And actually, they like time to prepare what they're going to say so brainstorming can be quite tricky unless they've had the chance to do the research in which case they get the chance to come to the brainstorm with lots of things that they've had a chance to think about already there's also we don't like being judged by other people we don't like looking foolish we don't like looking silly actually one of the greatest things that you can do is give yourself the freedom to be silly so i have a little golden rule which is basically that about 80 percent of what i say is okay 10% of what I say is absolute gold. It should just be written down the moment you hear it. 10% of what I say is absolute rubbish. Absolute and total rubbish. But if I don't give myself the freedom to say some rubbish things from time to time, I never give myself the freedom to say the silly thing that may turn out to be gold. Actually, interestingly, I mean, I presume you, have you done um, uh, improvisation and, and a little yes. yeah and there you don't do any research at all you just uh, go with whatever comes into your head don't you so we've got some um question poppy asked time scale how long would each stage take the workshop was half an hour to do the whole two diamonds <laughs> yeah so in a way i would think about the, the workshop as a practice opportunity you, you may well be doing more work kind of before during and after 
you may well want to kind of take your time over some of these processes. But in, in, in this particular workshop, I would spend, you know, 20, 25 minutes synthesizing, discussing the ideas that you've got, and then give yourself 20, 25 minutes to come up with as many ideas as you can. So which, then, right, which do you do first? Do you, I thought you do the brainstorming first and then... Oh. So, so in this particular context, because, of, because last week we asked people to go and generate and do their research and find some possibility, they, people should have some stuff to bring to the table to discuss in the round. And that allows you to, to then work out what the, what, the, what the question should be. Like, what are we trying to do and for who? Not just any old thing, but what's the problem that we want to tackle? Uh, okay, so we want people to start. Then you can diverge and generate ideas. And then on Thursday, we're going to go, right, of all of those possibilities, which ones are any good? Okay, so start with the problems that people have, want to focus on, and I suppose particularly the young people. So uh, um, that they hopefully will have problems that, I mean, last uh, week we did have a discussion about, for instance, violence against women. Um, yeah, it was one thing that um, people wanted to focus on as a, as, as a problem. So hopefully there are some other problems uh, to work on. And of course, yes, there is an expectation that people will get together, chat or by themselves. And of course, you can come into the space any anytime you like, uh, as well as just chatting to your friends. Hopefully this gives you a process that you can kind of do whenever and wherever you do this. So actually, if I can go to, to Chris, Chris's question first. Well, shall I just uh, read it? Do you have to have a problem first before you go for ideas? We've got to read all of them because actually on the recording, you don't see the Q&A. Good point. So, yeah, I think you do need to have a problem or you can do it the other way. You can generate a whole bunch of ideas and possibilities and people do do this. But the thing to do then is go, is go back and go, actually, what does this solve? What does this do and for who? Because there are lots of solutions in the world looking for problems. And, and it's quite difficult. And, it, and it's often the reason why lots of startups fail because people go, hey, I've got this amazing thing. And it transpires nobody wants it because it transpires nobody actually had a problem. Or the only person who saw that as a problem was me. So there is something about finding real validated problems in the world as a focus for generating ideas, or at least if you've sifted a whole bunch of exciting possibilities, that you go back and you find real people with that real problem for whom that creates real value. Which I guess takes us to, to Wan's question. So what counts as an idea? Can it be a problem identification or is it directly a solution proposal? Yeah, so the language here does get a little bit mixed up. I, I would, certainly think in the first instance about identifying a clear problem, conjuring a how might we question out of it, and then generating ideas in response to that. The, the tricky bit comes is that sometimes we refer to ideas as those hunches that something might be a problem. Okay, can we have a, okay, Dave, can you give an idea, give an example of a problem and then a, the conjured up, how would you do X, and then example of an idea, you know, just to, just to help people. Okay, so uh, for example, I'll use I'll use what I was what I was doing earlier. So my problem is that I have to plan three classes for November this year that I've never taught before. So I have a quite a clear problem. I need to get a group of students from one level of understanding to another level of understanding to build their skills, to build their confidence along the way. So my how might so I have I have a problem. I, I need to get some a group of people, a stakeholder group, from one place to another. My how might me might be, okay, how might I get this group of students uh, to be more competent and more confident using, in this particular case, systems thinking? And then I can generate a whole load of ideas from that. I could be, well, okay, I could do that by giving a series of lectures. I could run a series of interactive workshops. I could give them some really interesting reading and then run a series of discussions about it. I could get them to undertake a project. So I've gone from a, a slightly vague, but I've got a group of people and I've got a problem. I framed a specific question. I've got these parameters that I kind of need to do it in a month. There are other parameters that I know and I haven't told you yet about 
how much time I've got, how much time my stakeholders have got, what technology I've got available to me, what resources I've got available to me. Those are my constraints. They give me my how might we, and then I can generate a bunch of ideas in response to that. And then I can start to pick through those ideas and go, right, well, the lectures won't work because actually I need to interact with people to judge how well they've adopted that. And they need to do something practical if they're going to build confidence. But I've only got about two hours a week to do it. So actually, that means I need to use my time wisely. So you can start to see my kind of thought process there of going from problem to specifics to potential solutions and then picking the best of those. So I've kind of gone through that whole process. Can I just test them with you? Because uh, that's quite a sort of specific yeah. challenge. And one of the things this morning people identified as a problem is that because of COVID-19, people have been scared of public transport. And there's a real issue that people will then go back to private, their own cars, you've got expansive cars and all the, uh, the issues of pollution, climate change, et cetera, will get worse. So, so I suppose then do you then generate say, how might you get people uh, uh, onto bicycles or how, what would be the what would be how might you? So, so, so there's a whole bunch of potential how might we there. Yeah. So for example, you could say how do we encourage more people onto public transport? But that's that's very big. You can't say how might we uh, persuade existing public transport users to remain using public transport. We might say, how might we encourage people back onto public transport or, or how might we persuade people that public transport is still safe? But there's lots of ways of framing that, that arrive us, that give us slightly different ways of thinking about what the solutions might be. So the one that sort of is about getting everybody back on public, public getting everybody on public transport is quite different to the way that it, the question and the solutions that you'd get from saying, how do you persuade people who did already use public transport to come back to public transport? You might even tackle a different stakeholder group, like how might we help public transport providers persuade their users that they are in fact safe? So there's lots of ways of constructing that question. And if you hear those questions, you kind of know that actually the ways in which you'd respond to them with answers are actually all subtly different. And it might be that a number of different questions get you to lots of different potential outcomes. And then I suppose once you've hopefully brought some ideas in, you then do a brainstorm and hopefully out of that, something slightly wacky or different or unusual comes out to God, I bet no one's thought of that before. Uh, yeah, and that's the sort of process. That will, also, that will also depend on what you fed yourself in the research process. Yeah. So if you've seen not just the public transport solutions that you already know from your area, but you've seen some really outlandish public transport solutions from around the world that you've not seen, or you've seen some kind of futurists work on what the future of public transport might look like, or you've thought actually maybe the issue is not about transporting people physically, maybe it's actually just getting somebody at A in contact with somebody from B. I mean, the answer to that might be not public transport, but video conferencing. It might be that we don't need to move the people at all, but we just need to find a way to allow people to be in touch with one another. So how you frame the question is so important to the kind of answers that you get. And it's interesting people then link to the fact that if everyone's at home, then they're isolated, but with all this spare space because no one's going into it and sitting around. So there's all sorts of connections. People connect. Um, Aline, you asked, how can we select our constraints to give our direction, a give our idea a direction? I, I think we've sort of answered that a bit, haven't we, by defining yeah. a problem? Or... So, the, so some constraints will be basically just resource dependent. They'll be absolutely related to the amount of time or money or resource that you have access to. You could decide that there are... Um, more arbitrary constraints that you want to apply because you think they're interesting and useful. So for example, the team at Volkswagen had identified that a really good way to get people engaged with issues was a sense of fun and playfulness. That this was something that attracted people and it wasn't about beating people with a stick to make them do things. It was about making something kind of really easy and attractive to do or that attracted their curiosity to get them to do something. 
And once you decide from your research that that might be an interesting rule, okay, let's solve this, but, but let's solve this by making this fun. Well, let's solve this by requiring people's curiosity. Actually, you get very different answers that that lead you in interesting directions. So some of some of your constraints will be things that you can't do much about. They'll be very necessity driven. Some of them might be far more possibility driven that you might go, well, actually, this is just a really interesting way of framing this that gets us to an interesting place. Okay, so any other questions we could uh, finish there, people could start chatting. We could also start the workshop um, you know, at least on time, so we have a bit more time to get through the workshop. Um, but um, can I ask, are there, are there any more questions? Is, is this becoming a, a lot clearer, hopefully, uh, where we're going for? Because we sort of identified problems, things people care about, things that matter, uh, and now we're trying to generate a whole vast range of ideas of solutions and try and find the ones that are really different, extraordinary um, to to take forward. That's sort of, I think, basically where we're at. Absolutely. So we haven't got any more questions. So I think people know, uh, and, and we can stop now. I'll tell you what, since previously this morning, people said the workshop uh, was a bit short. Let's stop now and then start at 5-2. So we'll just have a brief breather so people can uh, get a drink, whatever, get a glass of water, and people will actually chat on their table. Um, and then we'll start the workshop at 5-2 um, the hour, okay, whichever hour it is with you. <laughs> it's it's 1748 for me, but I know people are elsewhere. Um, so, okay, thank you very much, Dave. And uh, uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow, uh, no, Thursday morning. <laughs> we'll start judging those ideas, but for now, let's not let's not be judgmental. Let's just entertain all the possibilities that we arrive at. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks very much. Cheers.